So we're going to pick up in Luke 11, starting in verse 27. And this falls right after he's been accused of being Beelzebub, the devil. And as he said these things, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said, Blessed is the woman that bore you, and blessed is the breast which nursed you. Blessed be Mary. And all that she's done to raise you. Now, most loving and adoring sons go, you're right, my mom is special. And and for every boy, I, I guess, I mean, my mom, you can say anything you want about my dad, but the fastest way to get your, uh, uh, to get beat up is to say something about my mom. Now is to say something about my wife. That's the fastest way to enter Broke Hipville. You know, boys love their mamas. And they dote on their mamas. And, but what, what, look what Jesus says. When he said, Blessed, rather, are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Even here, he does this. And this has come up once before. Jesus, your mother and brothers are outside. And he says, well, who is my mother and brother? Those that work for the Lord, who hear what I say and do. And notice he keeps bringing this around. You say, well, this is seems odd around Christmas time. Well, the reason why I bring this up about Christmas time is a lot of times we get caught up in the trappings of the season. We, we, we catch ourselves, and it's very easy to do. When I was a young boy, I don't know if any of you were young boys, or some of you might be older than me. I don't know if you had catalogs when you were younger than me. Uh, for those of you that are younger, you don't have catalogs. I, I don't know how your parents are getting the crayon off the computer screen. Um, but when I was a kid, my brother and I would circle things in the Sears catalog. Who remembers the Sears catalog? Huh? And we would leave notes, and do- just in case our parents were, were, were moronic, we would dog ear the pages, right? Because mom and dad, they're not the sharpest knife in the box. And, and for me, as a child growing up, though I was saved at a very early age, Christmas was about getting. It was about cool junk under the tree. And then as I began to get older and older, it began to shift. And I really began to understand the whole purpose of why Christ comes at Christmas. And now, I understand when my parents said, don't, I don't really need anything at Christmas. You know, I've already got anything. Uh, the last few years, I've sat and I've watched the joy of my kids opening presents. And, and, and had more fun watching them open presents than me opening up, you know, Bath and Body Works again. <laughs> Apparently, I smelled last year, and she fixed that problem. I'm teasing. She's a great egg. But now it's the thrill of that. But what's even more thrilling, though, is when they talk about Christ and talk about the coming of Christ. And we are in a culture today, especially within the American Mindset of a very secularized culture. We're no longer a Christianized nation where they are familiar with the concepts of Christian, uh, uh, Christianity. Yeah, they may understand Christmas. Uh, may, may, maybe it was a, was a Christian holiday. But, that, but many of your seculars are very quick to point out that it was an arbitrary date chosen in the 5th century by, by the Pope. And there's a reason why he did so. Uh, and, and they're very quick to point that out. And that it's a secular holiday. And, and, all, and blah, blah, blah. But our culture keeps asking us for signs. And notice what happens here in in the next verses. When the crowds were increasing, he began to say, This generation is an evil generation. It seeks for a sign. But no sign will be given except for the sign of Jonah. Now, why is he called an evil generation? Because up in the passage before, they just accused Christ of being the devil. And they demand for him to continue to give him them signs to validate his existence. 
Our culture today does that. It demands for signs to validate why we believe what we're doing. Do you have my slide ready? I have one slide. You'll be thrilled. One slide. Can you see that? Turn the lights off up on the stage. Can you see that now? What Does anybody know what that is? Of what? This is the sign. This is the star. It's designed to represent the star that the wise men followed to the birth scene. And this is in Verona, Italy. And that is the only, one of two only working coliseums left from the Roman era. And every year around Thanksgiving, that star is put up coming out of that. And inside that cathedral, on multiple levels, are what they call koreshes, which are nativity scenes that are made from all around the world. And you can go in and see how different cultures interpret the birth of Christ. And it is occur and everyone goes, and it's expensive to go in there and, and look it out. And it's always packed. And there's always a line. And it's in the middle of a city that's in totally secular. And you ask them what that star is, they'll tell you that's the star of Bethlehem. And they'll tell you that inside there are nativity scenes from all around the world. You ask them if they go to church, they poof, no. They demand a sign. They have a sign. They have multiple signs. And yet they reject the signs. And they reject the signs because the signs indicate to them that the lifestyle in which they live must be abandoned for the lifestyle of Jesus Christ. And that lifestyle can't be obtained by simply going, well, you know what, today I'll choose to be a Christian. It, it, the, that happens through the change that occurs when Christ calls you to be His and the Holy Spirit indwells you and you are reborn to be a new creation. This generation today asks us for signs all the time. And, and, and the sad thing is, they don't want the sign to justify your belief system. They want the sign so that they can negate yours. They demand for signs because in so doing, you'll present your best evidence and then they can dismiss it all away. Notice what Jesus says here. I'm done. You can go ahead and flip that, the lights back on and that's, that's it. We may reference it back, but you know what it looks like. No sign will be given to this generation except the sign of Jonah. Well, now, if you are familiar with the story of Jonah, you know that Jonah spends what in the belly of what? Three days in the belly of a fish, Right? Now, don't worry, we don't know what kind of fish it is. It says a great fish in the Hebrew. It's a great fish. That's all it means. But Jonah is the sign for that generation. Now this is language that isn't fully understood because Christ is still alive. But Christ is making the comparison between he and Jonah as to why he is the sign for this evil and wicked generation. And the sign will be that he will die. You say, well, why is this important? Folks, the coming of Christ, the death, or sorry, the, the birth of Christ does not obtain for you salvation. It doesn't have the ability to obtain for you salvation. If all we have is Christ in the world, there is no remission of sin. That comes upon his death. See, when we focus in solely on Christmas and solely on the trappings of Christmas and solely on the things of Christmas and we begin to elevate that to where it is the chief end-all, be-all of holidays, we, we miss out. As a matter of fact, if you go and historically look, we can get within two to three years of when the birth happened and then once you get those years established, you can get to maybe two to three months in which that can happen. You go look at the death narrative. It gives you the year. It gives you the man that was ruling it gives you the hour in which he dies. It gives you the place in where they put him. It gives you the details of the guards that stood outside. It gives you the plot of the Sanhedrin. It gives you the treachery of the Sanhedrin. It gives you all these infinite details that can pinpoint when, how, and why he dies. Now, one is not more important than the other. You don't have remission of sin if he doesn't come. But you don't have forgiveness of sin if he doesn't die. 
And a lot of times at Christmas, we zone in so much on that he's come that we a lot of times forget the reason that he comes. And the reason that he's come is the same reason that Jonah comes is for repentance. And the sign for that generation and the sign for this generation is the three days he is going to spend in the grave that then turns in to the resurrection. That's the sign. And to this evil and wicked generation, I would say today that our generation today is of the exact same quality and in the exact same makeup because of the things that we are willing to embrace as a culture. Saw on the news this week that a man received 52 years in prison for the stabbing death of his wife and then which he then decapitated her. You can't turn on the news, the local news, without finding somebody shot within Killeen or Waco. It's got to be the most dangerous places on earth to live. Politicians and movie stars abusing their power and authority to take advantage of people that are younger than them. There is debaseness and depravity at every level within our culture. We are embracing things as a culture that are extremely displeasing to holy God. Not much separates us from the time of the Romans, except how we dress and how we get around. And the cultures are very similar in those things. At the same time, you had political instability. You had always this rivalry. The, the, Jesus is talking to a generation that is demanding for signs. We live in a generation that demands signs, but they are not wanting to be convinced by the signs. Because here's the thing, if they wanted to be convinced by the signs, the signs are convincing. Notice that Zacharias was made deaf and mute in the temple when the angel of the Lord came and talked to him. Sign number one. Remember, we went through this when they first got here. When we first started in Luke, we went through every one of these signs. A woman who was barren and beyond childbearing ages, two miracles at once, was now bearing a child. Another young lady who's been visited by an angel. A man who's visited by an angel. People at the temple who when they see the child and when he comes up for his circumcision on the eighth day. I think it's Simeon or Simon at the temple. Who said that he would not, the Lord told him he would not see death until he saw the Lord's anointed. Anna. The boy who comes back again and teaches at the temple. The angelic host that declares the birth to shepherds who then go and find. And the whole town wonders at what's going on. Multiple upon multiple upon multiple upon multiple signs in that day that are historically verifiable. No one can make these up because multiple people saw them. Heard them. Even the Pharisees would be aware of what occurred to Zechariah and to Elizabeth. Yet now, they want a sign. Yet now they want to have something that feeds their unbelief because to believe that Christ is who He says He is requires them to alter their life in a radical way. Because many of them simply heard the law. Remember last week? With the lawyer that challenged Christ about who the neighbor was. He heard the law and he could repeat the law. But he could not tell you how to apply the law. We have folks in our current generation that that are the same way. We have folks that sit in the pews all across America today that, that know the commands of God. They know the requirements of a holy life. They know all these things. And we talked about this in Sunday school. Sunday school was a great, gave me some great pointers to put in there. We talked about the expectations that we have when we come to God. And if we lived with the expectation that every word, and this is what the text says, every word that flies out of your mouth, You will stand before a holy God and give an account. If you really had that expectation, do you really think you'd gossip? Do you really think you'd mutter under your breath? 
Do you really think you would say the things that you said when you thought it was safe to say the things that you said? If we really believed that every word was held captive, would you actually let that swear word slip out? Would, if you believed that you were accountable for all of your actions, would you live in a way that was displeasing to the Lord? And the fact of the matter is, we live this way because the expectations we have is that eh, God's either going to forgive me or God's going to let it slide. And while God may allow sin to travel for a little bit and allow you to dig a hole for you, eventually you will account. Well, He loves me. Yes, He does love you. I love my children. My parents love me as their child, I, I hope. Um, and they would let things slide. But then one day there came a reckoning. And it was usually with a long piece of leather and a chair and a lot of crying. Just because they allowed me to persist in my sin didn't mean that they were one, okay with my sin, or two, were complicit with my sin. Just because only God allows you to persist in your sin does not mean that you have escaped the anticipation of the judgment that comes with that. Conversely, also, just because you haven't seen the reward from working hard for the Lord, that the Lord has somehow forgotten. And what happens is we bring that to us with our culture, and our culture sees how we live. And, and do they see the sign of Christ's birth and the sign of Christ's death etched out in our life? Or do they see that there's a permissive God that really doesn't enforce His will even in our own lives? Is that the sign we're sending? And notice what it says here. Notice he uses the term Jonah. Now watch this. He's going to use pagans to confront Jews. Christ does this a lot. He's going to use two pagan examples to confront holy people. Ow, that hurt. Holy people. For Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh. So will the Son of Man be to this generation. Jonah, if you're familiar with the story, if you're not, we'll catch you up. Jonah is not a reluctant prophet. He is a flat-out rebellious prophet. He knows that if he goes to Nineveh and preaches what God tells him to, that God will forgive those people and those people will relent of their sin and God will spare them. And Jonah wants them dead because the Assyrians have political and military control over the people of Israel to the point that Israel pays them money to leave them alone. Israel is the victim of a big bad superpower bully. And Jonah knows... That if God obliterates the capital of Nineveh, the Assyrian problem goes away. And the children of Israel no longer have a problem. And they can rule themselves. And they can be free again. And so Jonah knows that if he goes and preaches a message of repentance, that the children of Israel stay slaves. So he doesn't go. As a matter of fact, he thumbingly uh, doesn't go in such a way that he is offensive towards God and all that he is doing. Now the Jews know this story. And as I said last week, this is an offensive story to the Jews because the Gentiles in the book of Jonah behave better than the Jews. Now, understand that. The Gentiles in the story behave better than the Jews. And Christ is going to use that again here with that generation. With this generation. That the men that Jonah went to go. They heard. And they repented. So too the son of man. is going. It, 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 what Jonah was to that group. The son of man is to this group. These people know who he is. He has not hidden who he is from these folks. He has demonstrated with the power of casting out demons. The power of healing. The proclamation of who he is. Now notice every time he makes the proclamation of who he is. He then looks at the disciples and goes. Some of these people won't ever understand it. But some of you will. And those who hear and do are the ones that understand what I'm saying. But notice what he says. Next. The queen of the south, this would be the queen of Sheba, 
will rise up in judgment of the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came to the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. This is what happened. Now, during the time when Solomon was greatly and wise, the queen of Sheba came, and she came and she, she listened to the wisdom of Solomon. This foreigner was humble enough to come. She's a queen of a larger power than what Solomon is. Came and listened to Solomon. Do you see the offense beginning to start? Right now, he's listed two pagans that are going to do something to the Jews of this time. And it's not pretty. She would judge the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Behold... Something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment of this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. Let me tell you the, the, the hot message that Jonah preached to the people of Nineveh. Forty days and Nineveh will be destroyed. No, uh, Jonah pre- did the least amount of preaching a person could preach and still it would be called preaching. And the Holy Spirit took that flawed message and led to the repentance of an entire city. Those pagans, and you understand how vile the Assyrians were. They were one of the most vile cultures that ever lived. Their leaders were known for their exceptional cruelty. One of them was known for tying people down and filleting layer of skin after layer of skin off the backs of his conquered victims. Malevolent things. Those people will sit in judgment of this generation. Because those people understood what was being said and repented. The the Queen of Sheba is going to stand in judgment. Now, here's the offense. You're a good Jew. You're a good Pharisee. You're a good Sadducee. And you're now being told that absolute pagans are going to judge you for your behavior. Mm. It's very offensive. Why? Why? Because there's something greater than just Jonah. There's something greater than the wisdom of Solomon. Christ is pointing to him. Christ is telling this generation and our generation today that though the signs that you ask for are great and numerous, and I can give you the sign of Jonah, and I can tell you about the Queen of Sheba, and I can tell you about all these things that you know... Just like with the star that's at Verona, or any time people see Christmas lights, anything like that, you may know of these events, but they've had no impact upon your life. And those of you who have had these events shown to you and demonstrated to you, and you're aware of these events and they've had no impact upon your life, people that you thought were wretches may be the people that sit in judgment. That sounds horrible. Why well, I go to church all my life? That's great. Well, I'm not as bad as Adolf Hitler. Well, why is it we always find the the worst person in the room to associate ourselves with? Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Ashley. I'm not as bad as Adolf Hitler. Great. Were you as bad as the person that hit my? No, nobody hit my car, but hit my car and then ran off and then leave a note. Well, maybe. Okay. Well, you're not Hitler esque, but. You figure that one out. Why is it whenever we try to make ourselves feel better about ourselves, we always pick a loathsome, despicable thing that we can all agree to is loathsome and bad. And then we use that loathsome and bad thing to justify that we're not that bad. That's what the Pharisees are doing. That's why they're asking for signs. That's why they're seeking to justify themselves about asking who their neighbor is. They're looking for how good can I be, yet not be too good, and not be too bad. 
You hear this when, when you sit around family and talk to them over the holidays. And they go, and, 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 and this, this question comes up. Yeah, I know that that's important, but does that really affect my salvation? That's like looking at your wife and saying, Yeah, I know what you're asking is important, but does that still, you know, will you still marry, be married to me if I don't do it? How about a wives? If your husband came in and said, Well, I, I know that's important. And I know it means a lot if I would do that. But if I don't, will you still stay married to me? In that moment, will you feel loved? How about it, guys? If your wife said that to you at that moment, would you feel loved? Yep, that's the answer we give to Christ. That's the answer these Pharisees are giving to Christ. How good can I be? How good can I be? Christ keeps bringing them back that those who are mine hear and obey not half the rules I give, not half the things I talk about, not some of the things I say, but all the things I say. Well, it's hard. You're right. Do you do it? No. I fail at it miserably. Why? Because I'm just like you guys. But it doesn't mean that I get a pass for the failures that I have in my own life. I have to account one day for every single one. And there are times in the midst of when I sin that I am like going, this is never going to catch up to me. And then after I'm done, the, the thought comes through my head and says, you fool. One day you will account for all of this. If we thought like that, How radically different do you think Christianity in America would be? Think about that. If we thought like that, how radical our walk would be. See, I'm banking on God's forgiveness, loving, and kindness, and praying He's not holy, righteous, and just. And we force that false dichotomy between him saying, oh, well, he's a loving and kind God. Yes, who's also righteous, holy, and just. And those two aren't, you can't split those out. He's all of those simultaneously. How radical our walks would be. Think about this. Think about what he's saying to these people. These pagans who deserve death, these leaders who deserve death because of their obedience will judge you because of your lack of obedience. But I put out a nativity set. I put a million lights upon my house with the star of David and a nativity scene. Look at all that I did. And the people around my neighborhood know that Christ is born because it's written on the wall of my house in bright, sprinkly lights. We were watching something yesterday where, where, where these individuals who have more time and money than they, than they have brains uh, start in like August and begin to annoy their neighbors with lights all over their neighborhood. I went out and bought two star showers, put one on one end, one on the other, and went, Christmas lights are hung. Why? Because that's the easiest way to get it done. Think about what would happen. Think about what would happen then if that generation understood what was being said to it, realized who was amongst them, and embraced him. You would have had more than 3,000 at Pentecost. And yet, people keep looking for signs. They keep demanding signs. When you watch any debate amongst any atheist and Christian, one of the first things they're going to ask for is proof, which is a, it's a form of a sign. Well, don't give me your life experience. Well, I, I can tell you what James says. I can show you my faith by my works. Sometimes my works are imperfect works, and I, I'd be willing to admit all of that. Let's see what happens here. There is something greater than Solomon. There is something greater than Jonah here. 
The sign of Jonah is that he spends three days in the grave, in the well. The sign of Christ is that he will spend three days in the grave. But unlike Jonah rising and being reluctant, when Christ rises, we have redemption. We have restoration. We have a relationship with the Father by the death, burial, and resurrection of the Son. And having all that and knowing all of that, at the height of the time when people seem to be more amenable to the gospel presentation because just about everybody in the world has a nativity scene and somewhere at their house or they have lights up or they're in the Christmas season, we, we have one of the most golden opportunities to reach upon fertile ground and plant seeds. We spend that time getting up early on a Friday morning to go get a good deal on TV. Or to get a good deal on a VCR. Oh, sorry, they don't sell VCRs. DVR, DVD players. Sorry. sorry. I don't set my clock on my VCR. I just take a piece of electrical tape and tape over it. Problem solved. We take our time to amass. But do we take time to spread seed? And so the sign the culture sees from us is Christianity's nice, but having stuff is nicer. You see the sign that you're sending. I've been guilty of that as well. I like getting gifts. I buy most of mine now. So, but it's an excuse to buy really nice, expensive gifts for me and then put my wife's name on it. You shouldn't have, Stephanie. How did you know I needed another tool or firearm? How did you know these things? Yeah, I'm so loved by you. <laughs> Golly. But the person in the store and the people around me, do they see anything uniquely different? Or do they just see that I am ass just like they am ass? Follow out. Starting in 33. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it in a cellar or under a basket, but on a stand, so that those who enter may see the light. After receiving the sign, after understanding what Christ is saying, after believing in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you don't simply take the light that you have, that you have received. And John, 1 John talks about this, that if we have fellowship with the light, we're His. But if we say we do and we are sinning, we are not His. We have this light, dark motif all the way through the Gospels and into John. You don't take a light in a dark room and light it and then tuck it behind things and go, I'm going for that ambient glow look. How many of you would do recess lighting with candles? You know, if you want your house to still be there when you come back. Right? Aren't you glad we don't put live candles on Christmas trees now? All that stuff under the tree would go up with the tree. You don't take a light, light it, and then go, a little flashlight comes in handy. See the light? If I did this when the room was dark, is that helpful? Would anyone benefit from the light? But I had the light. I have the knowledge of the light. I know what the light brings and what it brings to me. But as long as I take this and do this with it, will my culture see the light? Will my family and loved ones see the light? Jesus is making it clear. No one takes a light. That would be so counterintuitive in a dark room to take a lamp and light and say, hey, y'all, it's dark. I'll go light a lot. Then you take it and you go, where are you going with the lamp? I'm going to put it in the cellar and do us the most good. Everybody in the room would be beating that dude up to get the light back. Because it makes no sense. 
Yet that's what we do. Even in times like now, is we have the light and we don't share the light. And so the generation keeps asking for signs, yet we refuse to give them signs. Because at times we may not know the signs. And so we present to our culture a lightless and dark world when we have the only light. Notice what he says here. Your eye sees the lamp of your body. Sorry, your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But when it is bad, your body is full of darkness. Therefore, be careful lest your light in you be darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part of dark, it will be wholly bright, as when the lamp with its rays gives you light. John makes this point over in 1 John. When he addresses fellowship with the light and fellowship with darkness. Luke is making this point here. Well, you may have light, but that light may be tainted with the sickness of sin. Because you are living a rebellious life. And when your culture asks for a sign, what they see is a dark light. They see a mixed light. They see a light of acquiring because that's what God wants you to have. They see a light of, well, that God thing is nice. I show up on Sunday, but it doesn't really matter much week to week. That God thing is nice and it's cute. And yeah, I like Jesus and all, but you know, there are some things in there I just can't keep going that way. And you see this with ministers and, and churches in our nation today where they cave on moral issue after moral issue after moral issue. There are some churches, um, was it you or was it Eric that was saying there was a church that says you don't have to believe to belong? You don't have to believe to belong to a church. No, by the very definition of the word church is ecclesia, the called out ones. You kind of have to believe to be the called out ones. Go, that's not on my slide. Goes with the name. They're coming to take me away. Ha ha, he ho ho. You don't have to believe to belong. Why? Because some people's lights shine darkly. Notice how he goes back to the light illuminating the room. The rays of the light. Just as the rays of the light illuminate for people to see, the rays of the light that is within you illuminate the world to see Christ in you. What do they see? I'll be the first to admit that times that they, they, if, they're, if they're in front of me, going slow, they're going to see light. Just not the light of Christ. And one day I'll stand and account for every one of those times I was a poor light. When you're taking too long at a restaurant and you begin to get frustrated and, and they see a light, but they see the flawed light. See, at this time of year, it's great. It's great that we look at Christmas. It's great that we celebrate the birth of Christ. And if all Christmas is is a nice, cozy, warm holiday where we show up, we sing some hymns, we hear some Christmas uh, preaching, and that's it, and we go out into the world, then what kind of light are we taking to the world? Christ keeps pointing to his death. Because it's in his death that this light enters into us. And then we are indwelled with the third person of the triune God. And our goal is not to go, well, I'll sit and I'll be in silence and I'll let the preacher say to the people that come. No, we are to go into, the, into a hurting and dying and dark world with the only light that matters. And some of us are doing it really well. And some of us 
take that lit candle and they go to a cellar and they put the light on a shelf in the cellar and then they close the door to a windowless room and they have light but nobody else around them sees the light you're here today next weekend is Christmas Eve it's the birth of our Lord and Savior the second greatest holiday in Christendom the first greatest holiday is that of Easter let me ask you as you're opening presents and you're feeling the warmth of that let me ask you what light shines out of you what sign do you present to this evil age do you simply hear or do you hear and do